We're going to have a short video. We've been talking about poetry in the Bible, how biblical poets love design and masterfully use metaphor and symbolism. These poems invite us into an experience to ponder ideas slowly and from many angles. And the largest collection of poetry in the Bible is the book of Psalms. So that's what we're going to look at here. Now, the Israelites composed lots of poetry throughout their history. Yeah, poems were written by Israelites, sages, kings, and prophets. Some poems were sung by choirs in the Jerusalem temple, while others were prayed by families at home. And over the centuries, the most important and widely read poems were compiled together to be read or sung on special occasions. And I'm familiar with books of poetry, a large collection of the greatest poems in one place, and I can read through and pick my favorites. But the Book of Psalms isn't that kind of collection. Here, each poem has been expertly crafted and then placed where it is for a reason, to create a storyline from the book's beginning to its end. The Psalms poetically retell the entire biblical story, and they invite you into a literary temple. A literary temple? Yeah, so the tabernacle and then later the temple in Jerusalem were where ancient Israelites went to meet with God. When you arrived, you would see art and imagery everywhere. You'd see priests performing rituals. You'd hear songs and prayers. All of it symbolically proclaiming that your God rules the world from this mountain and you're in his living room. So the temple was a place to be in God's presence and also to immerse yourself in the story of God's kingdom. Exactly. And so try to imagine how traumatic it was when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, plundered and burned the temple, and then took many Israelites into exile. Yeah, where can they go now to meet with God, to sing their story and say their prayers? That's where the book of Psalms comes in. It's a prayer book for exiles designed as a virtual temple. You enter the Psalms to meet with God and to hear the entire biblical story of God's kingdom sung back to you in poetry. Cool, but how does the Psalms do it? Let's start with the book's design. There are 150 poems broken up into five clear sections. At the beginning, there's been placed a short introduction, Psalms 1 and 2, which lay out the main themes of the whole book by reviewing the biblical storyline. Okay. Psalm 1 looks back to the Garden of Eden and its river of life. Yeah, God placed humanity in a garden temple. And here, humans decide to define good and evil on their own terms, and so are exiled from the garden. But the first psalm paints a portrait of hope, about an upright human who delights in God's wisdom, which is called Torah, or instruction. This person is like the tree of life in the garden temple. They eternally blossom because they're planted in the river of God's life. Yeah, that's beautiful. But who's it supposed to be? Well, remember that story in Genesis. After humanity's foolish rebellion, God made a promise. Oh, right. A future human, the seed of the woman who would come and defeat evil and restore the world. And that's what Psalm 2 is about. God's promise that a king would come from the line of David. He's called the Son of God and the Messiah. God appoints him to bring justice on human evil and to restore God's kingdom and peace over the nations. So Psalms 1 and 2 introduce all these main themes. Yes, and then the book develops those themes through the five sections. The first two explore the complicated story of David and his royal family. The third section focuses on the tragedy of Israel's exile and the downfall of David's royal line. But then the fourth and fifth sections rekindle the hope for the Messiah, a new temple, and God's kingdom on the other side of the exile. Then the book ends with a five-part conclusion, praising God for his faithfulness. Cool. Now, nearly half of the Psalms are connected to one guy, King David, who God chose to rule Israel. Yes, David's story is really important in this book. He experienced many times of hardship, but he trusted God with radical faith. And in these poems, David shares his fears, confesses his failures, and offers thanks to his Redeemer. And he's constantly speaking of a deep longing to be in God's presence in the temple. But wait, David lived before the temple was even built. Exactly. This portrait of David, hoping and praying for God's kingdom and a future temple, it resembles the hopes of the later generations of the exiles. And so David's prayers could become theirs as well. David's like a prayer coach, giving us words for how to pray and how to discover God's presence in good times and bad. Exactly. There are 73 poems connected to David, but most of the rest come from later generations of biblical poets, and they have learned to pray and hope like David. And so the end result is the Book of Psalms, designed as a virtual temple for all generations of God's people. This isn't a kind of book you just read once and put down. No, it's designed for a lifetime of slow rereading and reflection. 
These prayers and laments and songs of praise are meant to become our own. They're poems for exiles who are learning to live by God's wisdom and to seek God's justice in the world as they hope for the coming Messiah and the kingdom of God. Well, we're continuing our preaching series looking at the book of Psalms, which we've called uh, Songs for All Seasons, because the Psalms were the, the songs and poems that Israel sang in the ups and downs of life. They were the songs that Israel sang while they were in exile in Babylon. And they wrote these songs and collected these songs together to remind them of what God had done for them in the past to help them express their frustrations with their present situation and to give them a sense of hope for the future. And my prayer is that as we work through the Psalms over these next few weeks and months, that actually it'll do the same for us. It'll remind us of what God's done for us in the past. The Psalms will help us express our frustrations with this present broken and sinful world. And the Psalms will also give us some hope for God's kingdom being established on the earth in the future. And uh, so I would just encourage you, uh, why not try writing your own Psalms? psalm or or poem. You don't have to set it to music. Uh, You may not want to share it, but if you do want to share it, then why not put it on our our Facebook page? And just to encourage others. But there's something, I think, about about writing down uh, your thoughts and your feelings uh, and uh, just, I suppose, being honest with ourselves about how we're doing and yet also letting that lead us through uh, to, to faith in God. And as we've seen from these two Bible project videos that we've seen and uh, I do look them out on they've got lots of them on other books of the Bible and so on I think they are excellent really helpful what we've seen from these Bible project videos is that the the Psalms are not a a random collection of songs and poems that you just dip into I want to dip in there and and I dip in there and oh I like this bit I like that bit actually they are organized in a in a structured way to kind of lead us from from despair to faith they're organized to lead us from, from sadness to joy, from viewing this world with, with sorrow and pain, which, which is appropriate, but from leading us from that place to a place of hope because God has sent his Messiah to defeat evil and reestablish heaven on earth. And this morning we're going to look at the first two Psalms because uh, Psalm 1 and 2 together form the introduction to the whole book uh, of the Psalms. And um, <coughs> so let's read. Psalm 1, we won't read all of Psalm 2, but uh, we'll read Psalm 1 and into Psalm 2. Uh, And I'm reading from the NIV, uh, by the way, the NIV, New International Version. Psalm 1 and verse 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. 
Father, we just pray as we just look at your word together that you'd speak to us. Father, we thank you. You're not a mute God. You're not a silent God. You're not just a statue carved out of wood or metal, but you're a living God. And so our prayer is that you would speak to us through your word, wherever we are watching now. Would you uh, just speak into our hearts, we pray, by your spirit. Amen. Well, the first thing I want to talk about is happiness. Happiness, because the Bible is very clear that, that authentic happiness can only come through living in relationship with God and living in the light of what God says is good and right. The word blessed, which this psalm starts with, blessed is the one. That word blessed means happy. It means happy, not, a, not a, a cheerfulness, not simply a cheerfulness which might be dependent upon circumstances, but actually a deeper joy and a deeper happiness because we're enjoying the favor of the God who made us. We are blessed. And surely most people want to be happy. And these two Psalms tell us how we can be happy. We can be happy by living in relationship with God and doing what he says. Michael Wilcock, in his commentary on this psalm, he writes this, Practical theology must begin with holiness rather than happiness, with God rather than man. The world always, and the church too often, is man-centered when it should be God-centered. He's saying the way to, to happiness is to live a God-centered life. Not a life centered upon ourselves, but a life that is centered upon God. And yet, I agree with him that holiness is more important than happiness. But the wonderful thing that we see in Psalm 1 is that actually God connected holiness and happiness together. That actually, if we genuinely pursue holiness, right living before God then we will be holy and happy. But if we pursue happiness on our own terms, then actually we'll be neither holy, which has eternal consequences, nor will we be happy, really happy, deep down happy, because we're separated from God. We're in a broken relationship with God. And so God has connected holiness and our happiness together. And you see, the world tells you that the way to happiness is do whatever you want to do. Be who you want to be. Just live how you want to live. Please yourself. That's what the world tells you to do. And, and, and that'll lead to happiness. That freedom, that contentment. Live how you like and, and that's how uh, you can a- enjoy happiness. And we read that in, in Psalm 2 verse 3. We've just read the people say, let us throw off these chains and shackles. Let's throw off the chains and shackles that God imposes on us. Let's throw off the chains and shackles that the people of God impose upon us. That's the way to freedom. That's the way to joy. And yet actually it's a delusion because we don't see a a, a happy, content, guilt-free world around us. Actually, we see a very confused world, a world in conflict, a world that doesn't know what's right and what's wrong, a world that doesn't know what to do with its guilt and its shame. The world is adrift from any fixed moorings. And the Bible says in Leviticus 18 and verse 5, Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. See, obedience to God is not a burden. It's to be a joy. It's a source of of life. We've just read in this psalm, verse 3, The person who delights in the law of the Lord is like a tree planted by streams of water. Whatever they do prospers. So obedience to God and his word is a source of life for us. Now we're obviously in the middle now of a a British winter and there's plenty of uh, water around. In fact, there's usually plenty of water around in the middle of a British summer as well. But but there's plenty of water around. But these psalms were written much more in, in this kind of a climate than in this kind of a climate. They were written in a dry and dusty in the desert of the Middle East. That's where these psalms were written. And so uh, the only plants that survive, or at least the only plants that thrive, are those near water, near a river, near an oasis. And the oasis brings life. And that's the picture here. Obedience to God and his word is a source of life. When uh, in John chapter 6, when Jesus was teaching and he fed the 5,000, 
and then he brings some quite difficult teaching and people are like, oh, this is really hard. And so people say, oh, I can't follow Jesus. It's too hard following Jesus. And, and Jesus said to his, the 12 disciples, do you want to go too? You're free to go. I mean, is there, you can't force someone to follow Jesus. It's a free choice. And so Jesus says, do you want to go too? And Simon Peter replies, where can we go? You have the words of everlasting life. See, it wasn't that, oh, it's a burden following Jesus. I suppose I have to, it's a duty. No, no, this is life. This is the way to, to really enjoy life. This is the way to peace and harmony, peace in our souls and, and, and joy. And this, this is the way to happiness. And so obedience to God is the way to happiness. That's the first thing. But secondly then, well, what does that obedience look like? Well, the psalmist tells you, what does it look like to be blessed? How do you get blessed? Well, these psalms explain that, and they explain it with some do's and some don'ts. Well, actually, the other way around, some don'ts and then some do's. So firstly, this psalm says this is the way to happiness, and it says, okay, so there's some don'ts and some do's. Verse 1, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, and, and so on. Verse 2, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And that describes the Christian life. There are things that we don't do and there are things that we do do. There are things that we need to stop doing and there are things that we need to start doing. And so the Christian life isn't merely, well, I add Jesus on, I go to church, but everything else just carries on as normal. No, no. There are things that need to stop. There are things that need to start. That's, it's a turnaround of life. And so... Yes, it involves starting some things, but it involves stopping certain things. And so becoming a Christian changes you. And it must change you. It should change you. It changes your language. It changes your sex outside of marriage. It changes your gossiping or your criticizing and grumbling. It, it affects your attitude to the government and your, and your attitude to others. And it, it affects uh, your paying your tax. It affects everything. It affects everything. Because there are things that need to stop and there are things that need to start. Paul writes in the New Testament in Ephesians 4, <clears throat> you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. There is a putting off and a putting on. And in that passage in Ephesians 4, Paul then continues to explain, okay, these are the some, th some of the things you put off and these are the things you put on in their place. Actually, it's easier to put things off when you put things on. It's easier to stop doing things when you start doing the opposite of those things. And so Paul says, don't just be grumbling and criticizing. Actually, let your speech be helpful. Let your spe speech be encouraging. He says, stop stealing and work with your hands so you've got something to give to others and share with others. He says, stop doing this, start doing this. Don't do this, do do this. There's a putting off and there is a putting on. And so here in Psalm 1, we are told what the righteous, happy, fruitful person stops doing. They stop walking in step with the wicked. They stop taking the path that sinners take. They stop spending time in the company of those who mock God. Those three things. Basically, take care who you listen to. Take care who you copy. And then thirdly, take care who you spend time with. Take care who you listen, take care, listen to, take care who you copy, and take care who you spend time with. I would add for our culture, take care who you follow on social media, because they will influence you. And yet, this righteous, fruitful person, they don't just go along with the crowd and let themselves be influenced by everyone else. No, no, they stand apart. And so there are things to not do. And perhaps God is putting his finger on things in your life now. That things that you need, actually, I need to stop that. God's saying, come on, enough of that. That needs to stop. There are things that need to stop in order to be blessed by God. There are things that need to stop in order to find true happiness. There are things we don't do. But there are also things that we do do. There are things that we should do. And actually, it is this that marks out this person who is happy. And they, me they meditate on God's word day and night. Blessed is the one who does not do these things, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And he meditates on that law day and night. And because of that, he prospers. 
You see, the Bible is not a, a religious book just to be revered and then left on a shelf or left on a stand. <clears throat> Actually, the Bible is food for the hungry heart. The Bible is water for the thirsty soul. God has promised through the Bible to encourage and strengthen and bring life. This is water for a tree planted near it. It brings life. It brings fruitfulness. American teacher Jeff Perswell, he says this, At the beginning of this massive songbook, the the songbook of Psalms, at the beginning of this massive songbook that defines and informs and shapes true worship and authentic spirituality, this psalm, Psalm 1, makes a claim. True joy in God and fruitfulness for God is found in a life of glad devotion to the word of God. That's really helpful. True joy in God, fruitfulness for God, is found in a life of glad devotion to the Word of God. See, the Bible is God's gift to you and me. It is a means of grace through which God promises to speak to us and encourage us. And so you want to hear from God? Then read your Bible. Get some Bible time. You want to break free from some addictions or struggles, get some Bible time. You want freedom from fear and anxiety, get some Bible time. Now, there are many, many helpful books out there. There are many helpful videos. We love it when God speaks prophetically to somebody. We love it when God speaks to someone through a song. But God has promised to speak to us through his word. And if you will delight in God's word, and if you will meditate on God's word, then you will be like a tree planted by a stream and bearing fruit. See, in this season, if you are struggling, and it is obviously a very difficult season for so, so many people, then might I suggest that you turn off your TV and you open your Bible. Get some Bible time. And please don't hear that as a burden or a duty. This is a sort of life and encouragement to us. So it's not, uh, do I have to? No, no, you don't have to. I mean, it's up to you. It's your your free choice. You don't have to do that. You don't have to read your Bible. But you can't then complain that actually, oh, I'm struggling. I'm I'm feeling a bit cut off from God. I'm, I'm I'm struggling in my faith. I mean, that, that's, like, that's like stopping eating and then complaining that you're hungry. God has given this as a means of grace to speak to us. And if you want to hear from God, read your Bible. The psalmist worships God in Psalm 119 and verse 105. And then he says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. And I need that light right now. I need it. The world to me feels a bit darker than it used to feel. And I need God's light to shine into my life. And so do you too. So the psalmist says, okay, these are things we need to stop doing. And these are things that we need to start doing. So firstly, happiness. Secondly, there's some do's and don'ts. But finally, as was pointed out last week, it's essential that we see how the psalms find their fulfillment in Jesus and if you didn't see last week's sermon, then uh, you can look at that online on our, on our website, on our Facebook page, or on our YouTube channel. And uh, Will spoke there about how actually Jesus is the fulfillment of actually the whole, the whole Bible. And so when we read any passage in the Bible, we should be thinking, how does the, the, death, uh, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus apply to this passage? Particularly when we're reading the Old Testament. How does the life, death, and resurrection apply to this story, this text? It connects with it somehow. And that's what we're doing with the Psalms. And so while this Psalm (coughs) is certainly an encouragement for us to obey God and to feed on his word, we do need to be really careful that we don't preach a kind of Christian moralism that says, be good and God will accept you. Don't do this and do this and God will accept you because that is not the message of the Bible. Actually, the message of the Bible is is that we are flawed and we are weak and it's impossible for us to become righteous by observing God's law. We will always fall short. And so we have a problem. This psalm sets us up almost with a problem. 
That righteousness before God is the way to happiness. But however hard we try, we can never become righteous. We can't be righteous through our own good works. And so actually we can't become righteous, so we can't find true happiness through our own good works. However, read differently, Psalm 1 doesn't simply direct us how to live. Psalm 1 also describes a particular person, a person who would one, one day come. Because happy is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. There was one who did not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. His delight was in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditated day and night. That one was like a tree planted by streams of water yielding its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. One who would be completely righteous, who would be completely devoted to God. And obviously he's talking about Jesus. And if we look at the Gospels in the New Testament, if there was ever one who looked like a tree planted by a stream, it was Jesus. And then Psalm 2 then takes us on another step and describes this person as the Son of God, the King that God's going to put on the throne and says, blessed are all who take refuge in him. And so it's clear that these two Psalms together point us to Jesus and they move us on from Psalm 1 saying you need to choose between pleasing yourself and pleasing God to Psalm 2 where you have to choose between being your own king or receiving God's king. And so just as Psalm 1 says, you're blessed by being righteous, Psalm 2 says, and it ends by saying you're blessed by taking refuge in God's Son. Because in the end, our eternal destiny doesn't depend on whether we're good or nice people, but actually it depends on whether we've taken refuge in Jesus and received him as our Lord and our Saviour. And so these two Psalms set the whole tone for the whole book a whole book of Psalms, for all the different songs, because they all present us with choices. Are we going to choose despair, or are we going to choose faith? Are we going to choose being miserable, or are we going to choose praise and hope and trusting in God? And if you want to be truly happy, then my encouragement to you is devote yourself to God's Word and determine to live by it. There are things that we need to stop And there are things that we need to start. Perhaps God's speaking to you right now. There are things that you think, yeah, actually, I know God's speaking to me about. I know I need to stop that. And I know I need to start this. In a moment, we're going to pray. And why don't you just take a moment and say, God, help me. Help me move on from that. Help me stop that. Help me fill that with good things. And also, let's, in all of our devotion, not put our confidence in ourselves, but put our confidence in Jesus, one who obeyed God fully on our behalf and gave his life that we might live. And as we receive him as our Lord and Savior, then his righteousness is credited to us. Let's pray. And in a moment, we're just going to sing a a couple more songs. Do be thinking, as I say, online, uh, do uh, give if you feel God's given you some uh, something to share a Bible passage or something and do obviously put those comments down so let's, let's just pray Father firstly we want to thank you so much that you are concerned with our happiness that you're not indifferent to the human race but you're concerned with our happiness and you've given us a way that we can be happy and that is by living in relationship with you and honoring you so Father we pray Help us, help us to get into your word. Help us to see it as life, not as a burden. And we pray as we read your word regularly that you would feed and encourage and lift us. In this difficult and dark time, let your word be a light for our feet and a lamp on our path. And Father, we pray, help us to stop things that need to stop, start things that need to start. That through our lives we would honor you But above all, not putting confidence in ourselves, but putting confidence in your Son, in Jesus, the King that you've put on the throne. And that our lives would uh, honour him. We ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. We're now going to sing a couple more songs uh, led by Lou.